Um, hi, everyone. I'd like to thank you, like as Kathy just did, for joining us for part two of our four-part series on reopening Western New York. We had excellent participation during part one, and we've tailored this presentation to incorporate some of the answers to a lot of the questions that we received. As Kathy mentioned, I'd like to uh, remind everyone to please use the, the Q&A box to submit questions you have as the presentation goes on, and we'll do our best to address them. Up first, my colleague Ryan Lafferty will provide an update on guidance issued to employers and speak to some of the practical issues employers have faced with employees returning to the workplace. Uh, we'll then have Christopher Eckert and Ryan Castor, both audit directors with Fried Maxick, speak to recent updates to the Paycheck Protection Program and the Main Street Lending Program. With that said, I'll now hand things off to Ryan Lafferty. Hi, uh, my, as Jay just said, my name is Ryan Lafferty. I'm an attorney at Bond in the litigation and labor and employment spaces. And I'm just going to get right into, here, into things today because I, I have a lot to cover. So Jay, if we could go to the first slide. So this was the first slide from the part one of this, this four part series that detailed the, the phase one industries and the phase two industries as they stood two weeks ago. If we could move to the next slide, as you'll see a lot, a lot, a lot has changed since then. So current list of the phase two industries that are, are open or that have been permitted to be open since earliest of June 2nd are offices, real estate, phase two in-store retail, which is really just uh, essential or non-essential retail, what was non-essential retail, vehicle sales, leases and rentals, retail rental repair and cleaning, commercial business management, hair salons, barbershop, my personal favorite, outdoor restaurant seating is in addition to the takeout and delivery food services. And as of this week, higher education research was also added to the list. If you go to the next slide, um, the phase three industries, which are projected to open on June 16th of, of 2020, are restaurants and food services and personal care services. So now personal care services has been added to that list. The phase four industries have stayed the same with arts, entertainment, recreation, and education. And those are projected to be open as of June 30th. Another development was Governor Cuomo at his press conference on June 2nd announced that child care and day camp programs can open on June 29th. And that guidance came out this week. I'm not really gonna get too much into the child care or day camp guidance or really even the phase three guidance other than just, just generalities. But our firm is gonna be doing a webinar on Friday that will dive a little bit deeper into those two pieces. If anyone's interested, feel free to tune in. In. Um, so next slide. These are right now the businesses that still remain closed. We have malls, except that now in phase two includes curbside pickup for malls. Another caveat is if there's you know a strip mall or stores that have individual entrances can be open, but the, the indoor common spaces and malls are still closed. We have indoor on-premise restaurant and bar service is still closed. Large gathering and event spaces are still closed. Gyms, fitness center, and in-person exercise classes are still, uh, still closed. Casinos, movie theaters, with the exception of drive-ins and places of public amusement. So that's like your theme parks, mini golf, things like that. Next slide, please. So the, the state issued guidance for all of the phase two industries, much like the phase one industries that included the same general content, the summary guidelines, the more detailed guidelines for each industry, a template business safety plan, which each business needs to have in place before reopening, and then the affirmation. Each business needs to uh, read and understand the detailed guide guidelines and then affirm that they've read and understand understood the detailed guidelines. And all of that is available on the New York York Forward website and the link is here on that slide. Next slide. As I mentioned, the phase three guidance came, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but anyways, the, the phase three guidance came out this week. So that's a new development. So if you are in one of the phase three industries, that guidance is now available on the, on the New York Forward website. This has been a pleasant surprise. It's the guidance has been coming out with such a short turnaround for, for businesses to get prepared. So, so uh, this is available now that should be plenty of time for businesses to get ready for the June 16th phase three date. Next slide, please. So all of the guidance is really industry specific, but I am going to just go through some of the broad brush generalities that are in 
all of the reopening guidance that apply across the board to industries. The first one is occupancy limitations. So all of the reopening guidelines require that occupancy be limited to 50% of the maximum occupancy of the building or area as based on the certificate of occupancy for the space. So for some businesses who are, in tenant, who are tenants in, in commercial spaces, that will require some working with the building management to determine what the occupancy, well, what the certificate of occupancy says and, and determine what your occupancy limitations are. For businesses that uh, that have workers and customers coming into the space. The occupancy limitations include both workers and customers. So that's an important piece to note. Um, so the, the next thing is the physical distancing requirements. So there's the six foot physical distancing that's required between people at all times, unless the safety of a core function requires individuals to be closer. Uh, the example there is, you know, hair salons, you can't cut somebody's hair not being within six feet of them. And if social distancing is not possible, there's additional safety precautions that need to be taken to plan for that. Um, and then the, the, the smaller bullet point there, planning for situations where distancing is not possible. Um, so, for example, if it's not possible for individuals to be six feet, foot, six feet apart from each other, use barriers, um, requiring masks in common spaces, um, limiting occupancy for more con confined spaces like one at a time or only two, only, only 50 percent of, of the occupancy of an elevator can be in the elevator at a time and everybody has to wear masks. Um, just making sure that businesses are planning for, for to, to take safety precautions in the instance that, that distancing is not possible. Um, face coverings, so uh, employers have to provide face coverings to all employees at no charge. Um, the CDC has detailed guidance about what are acceptable face coverings um, and also some guidance about cleaning and, and how to dis and discarding people or discarding face masks and, and other PPE. Employers must have adequate supply of masks on hand in case an employee needs a replacement. The, the guidance requires that employees be trained on donning and doffing masks and also cleaning and the masks must be worn whenever distancing is not possible in common areas like hallways, lobbies, or elevators, and by any customers that are, are patronizing your business. There's the hygiene and cleaning requirements. All of the guidelines require adherence to the CDC guidance and New York State Department of Health guidance for cleaning and hygiene um, and disinfection. Um, the cleaning should be done after each shift daily or more frequently as needed. So for example, common spaces might require more cleaning than just the daily or the, um, the per shift cleaning because more people are, are, are in that area. There's also a requirement that hand hygiene stations and sanitizing stations be put in place throughout the space. Um, if there's an area where uh, a hand sanitizer, a, a, a hand washing station is not available, there should be hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol content available. And last, um, the sharing of objects and surfaces should be limited. Communication. Um, there's signage requirements, so signs must be posted outside of the business as well as throughout the inside of the business, um, reminding people of the six foot distancing requirements, reminding people about the face covering requirements, reminding individuals about storing and cleaning face masks and other PPE. Um, there should be signage with information about how to report um, symptoms of COVID-19. And then there should be reminders to follow hand hygiene and cleaning procedures. Oh, so one other thing on, oh, sorry, go, can we go back? One other thing on the communication, um, you should be communicating your safety plan to employees. I think probably the easiest way to do this is just to distribute it to employees and collect an acknowledgement that they've read and understood the safety guidelines. That way you also have proof that you have communicated it in case you, you need that uh, in the future. And then lastly, all of the guidelines require that the safety plans be posted conspicuously in the 
space. So if you have a workplace, I would, it would be a good idea to post the safety plan where you, wherever you post all of your other New York State mandated posting, but just know there is a requirement that the safety plan be posted in the workplace. Screening, um, the daily assessments are required for all scheduled employees, visitors, and contractors. Um, uh, businesses may also require temperature checks, um, but just note that if you are gonna do temperature checks, the individuals who are doing the screening and doing the temperature checks, there are additional safety precautions that have to be taken with respect to the screeners. Um, this has to be done before employees are permitted to come into the workplace, and the responses to the screening has to be viewed and documented daily. Um, one note here, something that, that I've, I've dealt with is, uh, for for uh, commercial tenants. Tenants are responsible for the screening of their own employees. The building manager is responsible for the screening of building employees, unless there's some type of alternate arrangement with the building manager. And then the last piece is the contact tracing and disinfection. So if there is an instance where somebody in your workplace becomes infected with COVID-19, um, you as an employer are obligated to notify the Department of Health immediately upon receiving notice about the, the positive test. Um, if, you're in a, if you're a tenant in a commercial building, you'll also have to notify the building manager and you'll all have to work together to determine, to cooperate, to trace all contacts that the infected individual could have had. And that's, um, that's close proximate contacts, which I'll talk about what that means a little later in the workplace, it, within the 48 hours prior to the onset of symptoms or the, the positive test. All right, now ready for the next slide, sorry. I'm just going to go through quickly some of the, you know, industry specific highlights, but again, um, you should be really, you should be delving deep into the detailed industry specific guidelines to, to get a, a good picture of what you're supposed to do and using that as a model for your safety plans. But for offices, some of the highlights are um, uh, businesses should be utilizing technology throughout the office to avoid congregation and touch points. So for example, something that our office did, we got, I don't know what they're called, but those little touch pens for using touch screens for our copy machine areas to avoid people touching the screens of the copy machines. Um, the use of shared workstations has to be limited and uh, something an important piece here is the office guidance applies to office portions of other businesses. So for example, if you were a phase one industry, if you were a construction business and you followed all of the guidelines for the construction industry during phase one, but you also have an office where your administrative support work is done, the office um, guidelines would be what would apply to that office portion of your business. For commercial building management, non-essential common areas and amenities still have to be closed off. So for example, gyms or game rooms. Um, and it's, it's on the commercial building manager to be setting the policies for areas that are under the building manager's control. So that would be elevators, stairwells, lobbies, things like that. Real estate, in-person showings are now allowed with social distancing and face coverings. They have to be limited to one showing at a time or one per, you know one household or family looking at that at the property at a time and you should be advising your your clients not to touch any surfaces and there are also specific cleaning requirements um, for the the showings in between or that, that you should be doing in between showings next slide I'm gonna kind of fly through these next ones because I really do want to get to the FAQs at the end. But for vehicle sales and leases, the big ones are occupancy shouldn't exceed 50% of the capacity of the vehicle and unaccompanied test drives should be allowed. In-store retail, you wanna be encouraging touchless payment options or pay in advance and close amenities such as water fountains uh, when available. Retail rental repair and cleaning, reduce walk-ins to the extent possible. And if you're doing you know, home cleaning services, you wanna try and make sure or encourage your, the homes that you're visiting, that encourage the, uh, the customers to be in compliance with, protocol, with safety protocols. Next slide. And then hair salons and barbershops. 
I'm not going to get too deep into this, but there were a lot of unexpected additional requirements here, probably because of the lack of social distancing and whatnot, which caused some problems, I think, for opening of salons during the phase two. But, um, but just note, there are significantly addition, or there are a bunch of significant additional requirements in the hair salon and barber shop space. If you go to the next slide. The phase three industry specific highlights, we have food service guidance. Um, this is one I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, the food service is gonna now include indoor dining, but again, the occupancy is gonna be limited to 50% of the maximum occupancy except as set by the certificate of occupancy. But for this one, it actually doesn't include employees, which is interesting. And then personal care services, that, what that means, what that's gonna mean is tattoo parlors, nail salons, and massage tables. It's not gonna include gyms, pools, or hair-related personal care services, like waxing, shaving, is not gonna be included in the phase three. Next slide. One additional update from this week that I wanted to touch on is uh, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202.38, which authorizes commercial building owners and retail store owners to require patrons to undergo temperature checks, and they can deny admission to people who refuse to take a temperature check and or who have a temperature above what the New York Department of Health guidelines prescribe, which is currently 100.4 degrees or higher. Just one little caveat on this, and I think this probably should be common sense, but if you are gonna implement a temperature checking policy like this, it has to be implemented uniformly. So you should be checking the temperatures of everybody who's coming into your premises. It can't be you know, pick and choose because that could open you up to discrimination claims. Next slide. All right, so these are some of the common more, it's, it's kind of hard to, to get super into detail with some of the common issues I've been dealing with because a lot of it is very, in, uh, is very industry specific, but um, some of the most common things I've been, or most common questions I've been dealing with is, you know, how to enforce the safety plan, what documentation should we be maintaining, what to do about employees that refuse to return to work, and then what to do when an employee screens positive for COVID-19 symptoms. Next slide. So on the enforcement of the safety plan, what do we do to enforce our plan? So all of the guidance requires that businesses designate a safety monitor to be in charge of enforcement and compliance. So that should be number one. You should be designating one individual to be in charge of making sure that your safety policies are being followed. Another helpful tool would be to develop checklists. For example, checklists for your hygiene and cleaning process, checklists for how to deal with an infected employee. This will help on two fronts. One, making sure that all of your steps are being followed, and two, giving you some documentation in the event that there ever is a complaint that things are not being followed, you have your checklists that you, you have your, you can have your data checklists to point to to say, hey, well, yes, we did all of these steps on this day. Um, you could be having regular meetings to discuss compliance and other issues. You know, I mean, I can sit here and tell you what all, what all you're required to do, but at the end of the day, you also have to run your businesses. So, you know, having, having meetings to discuss compliance will help you to kind of iron out any issues and change your policies if necessary to make sure that you're, you're maintaining a, a safe, you're, that you're maintaining a safe workplace. Ensure signage and communications of expectations is clear and disciplinary actions for violations. So you want to be making sure that you're communicating all of the expectations to all of your employees so they know that what's expected of them. And if they're not complying with the safety plan or procedures that they're, they're disciplined accordingly. Next slide. Um, what documentation do we need to maintain? So all of the guidelines require worker and visitor logs and what the guidelines actually require are, they say, so to the extent possible, businesses should maintain a continuous log of every employee or visitor who may have close contact, meaning six feet, with others at the work site. So again, it's a to the extent possible because we realize that this is going to be, this is kind of a tedious task, but what this is for is really for the contract the contact tracing piece of all of this. We want to be we, we want to be tracing who's coming in close contact with who so that there if there is an infection in the workplace, we can identify who's been in close contact with that person and take the steps that we need to take to isolate that individual from the workplace until it's safe. Um, sanitation logs, the guidelines require 
logs, uh, cleaning logs be maintained on site with the date, time, and the scope of the cleaning. Another thing I wanted to mention here about uh, uh, commercial tenants is that commercial tenants are required for the documentation of the cleaning of their space. The, if, if the building manager has like a janitorial service, the building manager would be required to keep the documentation of cleaning services of individuals that the building manager is responsible for. Um, you want to be documenting your, just as, as, a, as a good practice, you want to be documenting the steps you're taking to ensure employee safety. You want to be documenting your communications to employees. As I mentioned earlier, an easy way to do this is to get an acknowledgement from employees that they have read and understood your safety plan so that you have evidence of that, that the, the plan has been communicated to employees. And you want to make sure you're documenting change, documenting any changes to your safety policies along the line or along the way. And what these are really, you know, this is going to be really helpful. So there is, there are, there are a few different ways that employees could, you know, raise complaints of non-compliance with safety plans, but the New York State um, specifically on their website provides an avenue for employees to file complaints either with the New York PAUSE task force or with um, the New York State Department of Labor, which we don't know yet. It's a little bit unclear what that process or the penalties associated with it are going to be um, at this point. But you know, just going back to to the the complaint and investigation process that we as a firm saw and dealt with during the with regard to essential businesses with employees complaining about having to go to a workplace that they didn't feel was essential or things like that um, it did prompt an investigation from a relevant agency which I, I think it would be safe to assume if an employee complains to the new york pause task force or the new york dol about non-compliance with safety guidelines it would trigger some type of investigation and if you have this documentation it's going to really help to make that make the issue go away Next slide. Um, how are we doing on time? So we touched on this last time, the employee refusal to come to work a little bit, and I am really running close on time, and I really want to get to the part about what to do if an employee certifies positive. So I'm going to skip this for now. If we have time, I can circle back to it at the end. Um, so if Jay, if we could just move to the next slide. So what if an employee screens positive for COVID-19 symptoms? The three big, you know, overarching themes here are cleaning and disinfection, isolation and tracing and tracking. There's two different analyses that you have to go through here depending on what an employee reports. So an employee is either going to say they have COVID-19 symptoms, that they've tested positive for COVID-19, or that they've come in close proximate contact with a, with a person with COVID-19. And the analysis is different for COVID-19 symptoms or a positive test versus in someone who's come in close, close proximate contact with somebody with COVID-19. So we'll start with what to do if somebody says they have COVID-19 symptoms or a positive test. So if somebody says that they have COVID-19 symptoms, you should keep that employee, out, do not allow that employee to come into the workplace and direct them to contact their health professional for testing. If they get a test and the result is negative, then they can come back upon receiving the negative test. If they get a test and the result is positive, then you as a business have to immediately notify the Department of Health as well as the business, the building manager if you're in a rented space and you'll need to work co cooperatively with those two um, to, do the, to go through the contract tracing procedure. Um, you'll also have to clean and disinfect any areas in which the uh, infected employee came in contact, came in close contact um, in the 48 hours between um, your notice and they, they begin quarantine. And, the guy, uh, and you don't have to shut down the entire business in this instance, but what you should be doing is isolating the areas for disinfection. And the disinfection should occur um, at some point after 24 hours. And the CDC has detailed guidance on the steps that you're supposed to go through to disinfect contaminated areas. So I would consult that guidance um, in that event. If an employee who has tested positive is asymptomatic, then they cannot return to the workplace until they've done 14 days of self-quarantine from the date of the positive test. If they have symptoms, then they cannot return to the workplace until 14 days of self-quarantine from the onset of symptoms. And just as another note, employees are going to be eligible for either family first leave or New York paid family leave, both 
for the time waiting for test results and for the time off from work in the, in the event that there's a positive test. Unless if they are asymptomatic, then um, they, they could work remotely in that time and wouldn't have to use, use any paid leave. So, and then the other analysis is what to do if somebody comes in, if somebody reports that they've come in close proximate contact with a person with COVID-19. So what does close proximate contact mean? It means you've come within six feet for at least 10 minutes of somebody with COVID-19 in the 48 hours from the illness, from the onset of the illness until the quarantine or isolation period. So that's what it means to have come in close proximate contact with somebody with COVID-19. If somebody has come in close proximate contact with somebody with COVID-19 and has, is exhibiting no symptoms, then they have to, then they still cannot return to the work, they still cannot return to work until after a 14 day quarantine period, but there is an exception for if the person is essential and critical to the operation of the workforce as documented by a supervisor and HR rep in, consult, in consultation with the state and local health authorities. And there's a list of safety protocols that would have to be taken. Oh, there's my timer, so I'm out of time, but um, I'll just touch on the last piece. So if somebody has come in close proximate contact with somebody with COVID-19 and they're exhibiting COVID-19 symptoms, then you would just follow the same steps that I just detailed for an employee who's infected. And then the last slide is just next steps. I just wanted to remind you to keep checking back the uh, New York Forward uh, website. The guidance is changing often. So just make sure you're keeping, keeping up with the website to make sure that you're in compliance with the most recent guidelines. With that, I'll pass it along to our friends at Freed. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm going to introduce Christopher Eckert and Ryan Kastler one more time, uh, both audit directors with Freed Maxic. Uh, the last week has seen a flurry of new information come in, uh, new law come in, and guidance issued with regard to the Paycheck Protection Program and the Main Street Lending Program. I, I believe guidance is as recent as last night. So without wasting any more time, I will uh, pass things over to them. All right. Jay, thank you. Appreciate it. And, and you're right. Yeah, there were uh, a lot of comments yesterday from Secretary Mnuchin. Uh, so we'll, we'll certainly cover uh, as much as we can. So uh, starting with our first slide. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the most recent law, the Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act, uh, was signed into law on June the 5th. Uh, a couple significant provisions that came out of that. Uh, first, the extension of the covered period. So when the law was originally passed, uh, this was intended to cover eight weeks worth of expenses. Uh, that covered period has been extended uh, to either the, uh, uh, the, the more recent of 24 weeks or December the 31st of 2020, the end of the year. So um, one of the questions that still remains is, is there flexibility to be had between eight and 24? Is it a, is it a hard eight weeks or 24 weeks or can you choose an interim period? Uh, guidance hopefully still coming out on that. Uh, the second piece, uh, the reduced threshold of requirements used from payroll. So uh, the original law necessitated that at a minimum 75% uh, of, uh, of the dollars of the loan be utilized in payroll. Uh, that has been reduced to 60%. Um, still an open question I'll, I'll cover in the next slide as it pertains to that. Um, ultimately, uh, the loan term uh, did get extended to a five-year period. Uh, so this is after the forgiveness calculation is completed. If there is a, uh, an amount of um, dollars that are, remain unforgiven, uh, the repayment term has been extended uh, to five years for that. Uh, the interest rate, uh, which was at 1%, uh, remains unchanged uh, over the life of that, of that loan. Um, the uh, extension to rehire individuals, uh, that was extended to December the 31st of 2020. Uh, originally, it was June 30th. Uh, there are two um, exceptions that are permitted uh, in this. You know, one, which was one that had been issued previously through some frequently asked questions, pertained to uh, employees that were unwilling uh, to come back to the workplace. Uh, again, to the extent that there is adequate and proper documentation that uh, a similar job at the same pay was offered uh, and was not was refused by the employee, they will not count against you in your forgiveness calculation. Uh, the second one, uh, the second provision relates to uh, if the individual's business or work uh, does not come back to pre-COVID levels, 
uh, there's an exception that is uh, allowed under that as well. Um, uh, although the guidance around how you prove that uh, hopefully is still forthcoming. Um, the last piece here is some clarification as it pertains to participation in the FICA deferral. Um, now under this new law, entities can participate both in the FICA deferral as well as the PPP. Uh, the FICA deferral, as far as the repayment terms, uh, remains unchanged. Um, and, and entities have the ability to start participation in this at any point in time. It doesn't require any sort of um, acceptance or application. Uh, really, they have the ability to defer through the end of the year uh, with 50% of the balance due. And this is just the employer component of FICA, uh, not the employee. Uh, that would be due uh, December 31st of 21 with the balance, the other 50% due at the end of 22. Um, next slide, please, Jay. So as we've learned throughout this uh, entire process, uh, you know, the uh, rules continue to change. And as they uh, put new guidance out, uh, certainly more questions uh, come out of that as well. So again, as I alluded to in the previous slide, um, you know, what happens if an employer spends less than 60% of the payroll? So the initial reading of the law would indicate that this is a cliff provision. So if you were to spend less than 60% on payroll, then none of your uh, loan would be forgiven. Uh, in uh, Secretary, Secretary Treasury Mnuchin's um, uh, comments yesterday, uh, that is believed to be a technical revision that Congress is going to be working on. That was not the intent of the law. So expect some technical revision there to allow for uh, payroll less than 60% um, to still allow for, for uh, some forgiveness. Um, secondly, uh, the compensation rules, again, that $100,000 compensation threshold still remains in place. So again, 850 seconds would have been used under the original eight week period. Uh, it is unclear, although expected that it would be updated to be 2450 uh, seconds. Um, that also pertains to health insurance and retirement contribution being 40, uh, 2450 seconds. Uh, but again, uh, waiting for technical revisions on the law there. Another item that still is outstanding are the tax consequences. Uh, so the IRS had ruled, uh, although the law states that the forgiveness is not a taxable event, um, the IRS ruled that expenses that lead to forgiveness would not be deductible uh, for our taxable entities and therefore it results effectively in taxation. Um, again, still something that's being discussed by Congress. Uh, people say that they want to change it. However, at this point, there has been no uh, adjustment to that. So as we sit here today, uh, that is still uh, ultimately going to result in a tax liability uh, to the entities. Um, two other things that, uh, as, as Jay alluded to, were, were brought up uh, by uh, Secretary Mnuchin yesterday that I uh, felt like uh, uh, had warranted some discussion. Uh, first, uh, the Trump administration uh, has has indicated that they do not intend to release the identities of the entities that benefited uh, from the PPP program. So uh, again, I know at least uh, with some of my clients that was of interest or concern that some of this information may be made public. Again, that's their, um, that's their stance as it stands today. I'm sure subject to potential legal challenges down the road. Uh, secondly, indicated that there was still uh, about $130 billion worth of unused funds sitting within uh, within the program. So again, uh, you know, with all of the confusion that came out uh, around who's eligible, who's not eligible, I think that you saw a uh, pretty significant decrease in individual entities trying to seek these funds. Uh, so again, if there are people out there that do qualify and the qualifications have not changed under this new rule, uh, there's still the three elements uh, or the three ways to qualify for this program. Uh, if people still have not uh, applied, uh, there are dollars still available uh, to to get into the program on. So uh, that is the the update on PPP. Uh, I guess with that, I'll pass it over uh, to Ryan and have him have a discussion around um, uh, the Main Street Lending Program. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm going to here to talk about the, the Main Street Lending Program again, which was another one of the, the, the items that come out of the CARES Act that was put in place to assist uh, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, the program was actually announced 
by the Federal Reserve on April 9th. Um, it is a $600 billion program with the Treasury uh, kicking in $75 billion. Um, similar to the, the PPP program, um, you know, while the program has not yet launched, they have redesigned or reconfigured the program uh, and it's on its third iteration. Um, and, you know, again, we haven't even gotten to the launch date yet, but the launch is expected uh, soon. Um, it is a five-year uh, loan program uh, for businesses that were in uh, good financial standing prior to the onset of the pandemic. Uh, unlike the Triple P program, the loans are not forgivable. However, as we, as I talk about some of the, the loan terms uh, later on in the presentation, you will see that they, you know, they really are trying to design the program um, to cater to small and, and middle-sized businesses that, that may not have um, access to other means of credit. Um, under the program, the, you know, again, as I mentioned, the five-year program, interest payments are deferred for one year and the principal payments are deferred for two years. Um, that is a, one of the changes that came out in the program uh, this week. Uh, again, uh, early, you know, the first two iterations of the program, it was a four-year loan program and interest in principal were only deferred for, for one year. And so now uh, underneath the, the new uh, guidelines of the program, uh, principal payments will be deferred for two years. Uh, the good news is, is that you, if you are participating in the, the Paycheck Protection Program, you are eligible to participate in the Main Street Lending Program. So, you know, that doesn't, you know, participation in Triple P does not preclude you uh, from participating participating in the, the Main Street program. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, uh, not-for-profit organizations are not eligible. And I, I imagine we probably have a lot of uh, not-for-profit organizations represented in the audience. Um, the good news is, is that the Federal Reserve is working on a program that's gonna be very similar to the Main Street program that will uh, be eligible for not-for-profit organizations. So. So hopefully there's some, some meaningful information uh, on the next few slides for you. Uh, and then uh, the last item here, uh, kind of the overview is that the, the Federal Reserve uh, is participating. Uh, you know, they're purchasing 95% of the outstanding loans from um, eligible lenders. Uh, they have announced that they're going, their participation is going to cease on September 30th. However, that was the, the date uh, that they had put out there uh, when the program was announced in April 9th. So, you know, as we sit here in mid-June and the program isn't fully operational yet, you know, I would expect that that, uh, that deadline for their participation to be extended. Next slide, please. So who's, is my business eligible? Uh, you know, there are a couple uh, eligibility requirements to participate in the program. And, and as I mentioned, it is for small, and middle-sized businesses. So the first uh, criteria is, a, is an OR criteria. So you know, an organization can participate if they have up to 15,000 employees or up to 5 billion in 2019 annual revenues. Uh, again, this is another change that uh, came out this week uh, under the prior versions of the program. Uh, the eligibility requirements here were up to 10,000 employees or up to 2.5 billion in annual revenues. And one of the things uh, that you should consider here is that uh, when you are uh, counting up your employees and uh, tabulating your, your 19 annual revenues, uh, you do need to consider uh, the employees and revenue related to any sort of uh, affiliate entities. Uh, the next uh, requirement is that the business must be established prior to March 13th, 2020. And uh, that was the date that uh, the president declared the, the federal state of emergency. Uh, in addition to uh, being established prior to that date, uh, the organization uh, must be uh, must have been created or organized within the U.S. and must have um, a significant majority of their operations uh, or employees uh, based within the United States. Uh, and then the third uh, item here on the on this slide is um, basically if you're deemed an ineligible business to participate in the uh, Small Business Association regulations, you are ineligible to participate uh, within this program at this time. Uh, again, there's, I think uh, the SBA has a published list of 16 to 17 different types of organizations out there. Um, you know, again, not-for-profits being included in that, uh, financial businesses, life insurance companies. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all 
16 or 17, but you know, if you are deemed ineligible to participate in the SBA, you are ineligible to participate in Main Street. Next slide, Jay. A couple more eligibility requirements here. So uh, as I'll get into in the next slide, there are three different loan options available under the program and you're, you're not eligible basically to participate in more than one of the three uh, facilities. Additionally, uh, if you are an organization that receives support under Section 4003B of the CARES Act, which was really the, the portion of the CARES Act that uh, provided relief to the, and support to the airline industry, uh, you're not eligible to participate uh, within the program. And then the, the last item here is that, uh, again, when you're going through the, the application process, there are a certain number of uh, certifications and covenants that you must make as part of the, the application process. So, you know, you, at, at the time of application, you are going to have to assert to those, and you know, I'll lay those out in greater detail uh, later in the presentation. Next slide. So as I mentioned uh, previously, there are three different uh, program options, and this table really just kind of lays out the, the terms of each of the programs. Uh, again, uh, under all the programs, it is a five-year uh, maturity. Uh, again, that's uh, newly released guidance uh, compared to the four-year. Uh, the minimum loan size under the new loan program and the priority loan program is $250,000 uh, under each of those programs. Previously, the first version, uh, the minimum loan size was a million dollars, and then in the second version, it was $500,000, and now they further reduced the minimum loan size to $250,000 under, under each of these options. And again, based on the feedback that the Federal Reserve has received, they really are trying to you know, make this available to a, a wider, wider audience. Uh, and then under the expanded loan program, uh, the minimum loan size is $10 million. The maximum loan size, uh, again, there's a different calculation for each of the options here. Uh, under the new loan, uh, it's the lesser of uh, $35 million or uh, four-time four time multiplier of your adjusted 2019 EBITDA. So uh, again, you would, you would take your adjusted EBITDA uh, times, you know, multiply it times four and, you know, Add it to your outstanding debt, and that would be the, the maximum amount that you're eligible to receive under the program. Priority loan, uh, it's the lesser of $50 million or uh, a six times uh, EBITDA multiplier. And then under the expanded loan program, again, these are much larger loan sizes. Um, you are able to get up to $300 million or, again, a six times multiplier of your 2019 EBITDA. So as I mentioned in the overview, uh, the, in, moving down to the, the payment, uh, repayment terms here, uh, again, interest is uh, deferred for the first year, uh, principal is deferred for the first two years, and then years three through five under each of the, the loan options, uh, there's a 15% payment at the end of year three, a 15% payment at the end of year four, and then there's a balloon payment of 70% at the end of year five. Uh, so that's consistent, and those uh, repayment terms have, uh, again, been modified uh, based on some of the feedback received by the Federal Reserve. And finally, at the bottom here, the rate, uh, it is a, the rate is consistent across each of the options. Uh, basically, they're using a one-month or three-month LIBOR plus 3%. Uh, at last check, uh, you know, the one-month and the three-month LIBOR were both below 50 basis points, so uh, when you add the 3% to it, you're looking at a loan, um, at least in its inception, uh, that'll have an interest rate that would be south of 3.5%. Of um, and again, uh, as you're going to be going through and applying with your lending institution, these loans are uh, subject to their underwriting, uh, the bank's underwriting uh, method. So um, that is uh, something else I wanted to point out here as well. Next uh, slide. So then, the, then, as I mentioned before, the, there are a number of certifications that a borrower must make um, you know, when they're applying for these loans. And so basically, under, the, under each of the, the loan options, uh, you're not able to take the loan proceeds and make prepayments on any other uh, pieces of existing debt that you do have out there, uh, with the exception of the priority loan option. Um, under the priority loan option, you do have 
a one-time bite at the apple to, uh, you know, at the inception of the loan to take the funds and repay uh, any sort of uh, debt obligation that you have at a, a lending institution that is not the lending institution that granted you the, the Main Street program. Um, so that is one option underneath the, the priority loan option. Um, additionally, you cannot uh, seek to cancel or reduce any of your committed lines of credit. And then the, the last item here is that uh, the business must certify that uh, it reasonably believes that at the date of the loan that uh, it expects to meet its financial obligations for the next 90 days and does not, uh, again, expect to file for bankruptcy during that time period. So again, going back to my opening remarks that you know, the program really is designed for uh, businesses that were in good fi financial condition uh, prior to the onset of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So again, there's a, a, a number of uh, additional certifications that uh, the borrower must attest to. Uh, there are certain uh, compensation, stock repurchase and capital distribution restrictions. Um, and I do have these detailed out uh, on the next couple of slides. So I, I'm just gonna make reference to them now. Um, again, uh, businesses must also make commercially reasonable efforts to maintain its payroll and retain its employees during the time of the outstanding loan. So uh, a business can't take the loan and then lay off half of its workforce. Um, so again, good faith efforts must be maintained to uh, keep its level, current level of employment. Um, and then the, the last item here, uh, again, the, the organization must certify that it's eligible to participate um, and that there's no uh, conflicts of interest. And this really goes to um, ensuring that the business does not have a government official or immediate family member that has a controlling interest in the business that's applying for the loan. Um, so that's really that, that point there. Uh, next slide, Jane. So then the last couple slides, as I mentioned previously, are the loan restrictions. So uh, this slide really lays out some of the compensation restrictions uh, related to the program. So I'm um, going to start here with uh, officers employees that uh, earned greater than $425,000 in, in calendar year 2019. So throughout the, the life of the loan, uh, across any 12 month period, any individual that fell into this category uh, should not receive any excess income greater than you know, what they had earned in 2019. Additionally, uh, any severance that gets paid out to an individual within this category uh, should not exceed twice the total compensation received in calendar year 2019. There is one exception to uh, these restrictions and, and that is uh, our related to employees whose compensation is determined uh, through an existing collective bargaining agreement. Uh, obviously, you know, if there is uh, salary increases related to uh, a CBA that was in place prior to the pandemic, uh, those would need to be honored uh, throughout this program. The, the next compensation restriction is, is relates to officers and employees with uh, comp that exceeded 3 million in calendar year 2019. And again, throughout the, the five-year uh, term of the loan, uh, the, you know, any employees that sort of fall into this category, uh, they're not allowed to receive total compensation that is $3 million plus 50% of any excess over that $3 million. So say you had an employee that uh, received $4 million uh, in calendar year 2019, uh, their income uh, over the over the life of the loan would be subject to the $3 million plus the 50% of that uh, $1 million excess. So, you know, they would essentially have their compensation capped at $3.5 million over the, the five-year life. Next slide, Jay. So then the last two uh, loan restrictions, again, in addition to the compensation, is that you know any business that you know is a publicly traded organization, uh, they cannot uh, repurchase any any stock that's uh, outstanding uh, throughout the life of the loan plus 12 months following the conclusion of the loan. So uh, again, you, you can't repurchase any of your stock for you know, essentially six years after the the inception of the loan 
And then the last item here uh, is that, in, you know, in addition to not being able to repurchase any stock, uh, an organization is not permitted to pay dividends or make other capital distributions um, with respect to their common stock. Again, for the same same year, life of the loan plus uh, the 12 month period following. So it would be uh, a six year uh, cap. Uh, so you know, those are just some of that. I know I went through that quickly. Uh, again, similar to the PPP, the program continues to evolve. Um, we are expecting it to launch here within the next uh, week or two. Um, so you know, at this point, I think that kind of covers kind of a high level overview. And, and, and at this point, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jay. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yep. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today and submitting some good questions. We got back to a lot of people and uh, we will continue to take questions and use them as we continue to put together the, the remainder of this series. So thank you for coming out and we hope to see you at the next one.